In this video, we're going to talk about the Culpitz oscillator circuit. So this circuit requires a single NPN transistor to work. Now we're going to use an emitter resistor, RE, which helps to stabilize the circuit. And across that resistor, we need a bypass capacitor. The bypass capacitor increases the voltage gain of the circuit. And we're going to have another bypass capacitor at the collector of the transistor. So this is the base, this is the collector, and this is the emitter. Next, we have RB, the resistance associated with the base, and RC, the resistance associated with the collector. Now, instead of using RC, you could use an RFC or a radio frequency choke, something that has a very high inductance but low internal resistance, which works well for the circuit. But it's not required. You can still make it work without the uh, RFC choke. You could just use the resistor. Now, here is the important part of the circuit. We're going to need an inductor at the base and then between the base of the transistor and the ground, we're going to use a capacitor. And then between the inductor and the ground, we're going to have another capacitor. Let's call this C1, C2, and L. So these two capacitors and the inductor form the LC network that controls the frequency of the oscillations. Keep in mind, whenever you have a capacitor, and an inductor next to each other, they're constantly transferring energy back and forth. As the capacitor charges, the inductor discharges, and energy is constantly transferred between the electric field of the capacitor and the magnetic field of the inductor. Now to calculate the frequency of the oscillations, you could use this formula. It's equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of the inductance times the equivalent capacitance of C1 and C2. And CT is going to be the product of C1 and C2 divided by the sum of those two capacitors. Now we're not quite finished. In order for this circuit to work, we need to have some sort of a feedback network from the output of the circuit back to the input. So we're going to use a bypass capacitor to accomplish that. So we're going to attach it to the collector of the transistor. So at the output, we're going to send some of the AC signal back to the LC network so that the oscillations will be sustained in the circuit. So it's very important to have that feedback network. Otherwise, the oscillations will die out. Now the bypass capacitor also serves another purpose. It blocks DC, but it allows AC signals to pass through it. Now if this bypass capacitor wasn't here, current will be able to flow through RC, through this area, through the inductor, and through the base. So current from the collector supply voltage will be able to bypass RB. And so you can get a large amount of current flowing through the base of the transistor, causing it to overheat. So it's important to have this bypass capacitor to block DC from entering the LC network. Now in this circuit, as current flows through the collector uh, resistor, and as it also flows through RB, it won't be able to go through the inductive the LC network because it's blocked by C1 and it's also blocked by C2. So the current flowing through RB has to go through the base of the transistor. And so it's important to have this bypass capacitor such that you don't get a large amount of current flowing through RMC that will flow through the base of the transistor because that could be bad. So you don't want to just connect a wire from the collector to the inductor. You want to make sure that 
this by cap bypass capacitor is present. Now I decided to build this circuit as well, but I made a a slight different version than the circuit that you see here. So I'm going to draw the type of circuit that I tested. So I still had RB, but instead of connecting it to VCC, I connected it to the collector of the transistor, and then I connected RC. After that, I had an inductor followed by a connection to the collector's supply voltage. And in the circuit, I use a 9-volt battery with a measured voltage of 9.16 volts. Now the value that I chose for RC in this circuit was 220 ohms. And for the RFC choke, or the radio frequency choke, I use an inductor with an inductance of 97 millihenries. It's a 100 millihenry inductor, but when measuring the actual value, it was about 97 millihenries. And the internal resistance of that inductor was 102.5 ohms. RB was set to 100 kilo ohms, and C1, I used the value of 4.16 nanofarads. It was a 4.7 nanofarad capacitor, but the measured value was 4.16. The measured value for C2 was 105.3 nanofarads, and L was 47.6 microhenries. RE was set to 100 ohms. And the bypass capacitors, each of them were 1,000 microfarads. I need to move this out of the way because I need to put the bypass capacitor here. This one was also set to 1,000 microfarads. But L, this particular inductor, as was mentioned before, is 47.6 microhenries. So at these values, I got a nice sine wave at the output. It's a very smooth sine wave with a frequency, a measured frequency of 364.3 kilohertz. The output voltage was about 7 volts peak to peak. So that's not the RMS voltage. So at the top was positive 7, and at the bottom, negative 7. So the Colpitz oscillator circuit works very well. It's very simple to build, and it only requires a single transistor to work, which is great. And also, the frequency of the oscillations is quite stable for the circuit. So here's a table of some other values that I've used in this experiment, as well as the output frequency that was generated from these values. So we have C1, C2, L, the output voltage, and the frequency. So using a measured value of 0 0.312 nanofarads for C1, and approximately 9 nanofarads for C2, and L being set to 5.8 microhenries. The output voltage, that is the peak voltage, was 4 volts, and the measured frequency was 3.4 megahertz. Now, at this high frequency, the signal was distorted. It looked something like this. It wasn't a nice, smooth sine wave. This is not the exact shape, but it looks something like that. Now, at the values that I gave you before, where C1 was 4.16 nanofarads, and C2, 105.3 nanofarads, L being 47.6 microhenries, with an output voltage of approximately 7, the measured frequency was 364.3 kilohertz. And also, 
I've tried these values, 0.44 microfarads, 9.56 for C2. That was a 10 microfarad electrolytic capacitor, but it was measured at 9.56 microfarads. And L was set to 3.71 millihenries. The output voltage for this was also about 4 volts, but the measured frequency was 4.77 kilohertz. The last two trials produce a relatively smooth sine wave at the output, which was good. Now let's use the formulas to calculate the theoretical frequencies for uh, these trials. Let's focus on trials 2 and 3. So first you need to calculate CT, which is C1 times C2 over C1 plus C2. So for the second trial, C1 is 4.16 nanofarads, C2 is 105.3 nanofarads divided by the sum which is 109.46 so this gives us a CT value of 4.0019 which we could say approximately 4 nanofarads so now that we have CT, we can calculate the resonant frequency using this formula. L for the second trial is 47.6 microhenries. So micro is, is 10 to the minus 6. And then CT, we said it was 4 nanofarads. Nano is 10 to the minus 9. So if you plug this in the way you see it, you should get 4.0019. I'm going to put it here. A theoretical frequency of 367.1 kilohertz, which is very, very close to the actual frequency of this experiment. Now, granted, for the other trials, we didn't, I didn't get good numbers like that one. For the third trial, it deviated from the theoretical value quite significantly. So I'm going to calculate CT again. So it's 0.44 times 9.56 divided by the sum of those two numbers, which is 10. And so this is 0.4206 microfarads. So I'm going to write that here. So let's replace L with 3.71 millihenries. Milli is 10 to the minus 3. And then let's replace CT with 0 0.4206 microfarads, or times 10 to the minus 6. So I got 4,029 hertz, which is equivalent to approximately 4 kilohertz. And so you could see that the difference between the theoretical frequency and the measured frequency was significant for these values. And sometimes that happens. But nevertheless, you do get a frequency that is relatively close to the theoretical frequency. But notice the general trend. As we increase the values of C1, C2, and L, as you increase those values progressively, the theoretical frequency goes down. So that's it for this video. Now you know how to create the Kolpitz oscillator circuit using a single NPN transistor. Thanks for watching.